Coming up in this episode of Bitcoin for Millennials. What is the main thing people need to unlearn before oh, they can understand Bitcoin? I think the it's a really good question because I like I'm, I'm trying to think of like what did I unlearn, but that's going to be different for everyone. I think a lot of people who currently are in Bitcoiners, what they'll need to unlearn is like it really just starts in a way with information where they feel like like if they get told, like, if you vote for this other party, if you vote for this other politician, they're going to make life better. They're going to make the system better. And I think the unlearning that people need to do is assuming that someone else is going to make their life better. And they just mm. vote for that. And that person makes the change happen. Um, like sort of like if you point me to the critical thing, like if you can make people unlearn one thing, and that will get the most Bitcoin adoption. That's the thing I'd point at. Like just making more people realize that nobody is going to like materially in the long run make your life way better, better than you can do it yourself. Yes. So if people were to unlearn that part, then they'll eventually kind of like, I think a lot of them will eventually end up a Bitcoin because they'll realize, okay, I need to do it myself. And this is a really powerful tool to be able to do that. All right. Hey there, this is Bram Konstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Sam Wouters. He's a renowned Bitcoin researcher and analyst from the Netherlands, and he currently leads the marketing and content efforts at River, a prominent US-based Bitcoin brokerage. With a passion for Bitcoin education, Sam has contributed extensively to the field, including producing River's renowned lightning reports. Welcome, Sam. Thanks, Bram. It's uh, refreshing to hear a podcaster who can pronounce my last name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's actually funny, you know, like uh, I, I think I am a bit lucky with my name, but a lot of Dutch people Englishify their names and then it, so it sounds kind of weird, right? So I just say Wouters. What do English yeah. people say? I, I guess Wouters. Do people, do people yeah. call you like Bram or how do they do it? Yeah, they say Bram. So that's that's okay. And then I say, yeah, Canstein like Goldstein. Yeah, that I works. like that. Uh, but you have in your Twitter bio, I think, Wouters, right? <laughs> like pronounce yeah, this. Like, well, like Wouters uh, to wow help them pronounce it. But that's great. I, I, honestly, I don't care that much. It's just becoming a thing at this point where yeah, people yeah. look at that and they all think it's like Wouters or something. <laughs> and I just want to help them out because they feel bad. And yeah, yeah. Well, I like Wouters. That's great. That's that's a good one. Um, yeah, man. Well, thanks for coming on. I um, I think it's nice to talk to a fellow uh, fellow Dutchie. Uh, we're doing it in English, but I think I think we'll manage. And um, yeah, I, I wanted to start with uh, you know you're you're a millennial too, and I usually ask you know like um, because the podcast is focused on millennials, and I kind of started when I realized that lots of millennials aren't really thinking about Bitcoin or money or inflation, you know, and so this mm -hmm. is like one of the goals I have. And I usually ask other millennials like, how do you experience talking about Bitcoin? with our generational peers? Like what, what is your experience? There's, I think there's a lot of variety there. There are some people who like, obviously like us, there are some people who get it or who are at least concerned about kind of their future. And then there are people who absolutely don't want to hear it. Kind of to your point. Um, I think a lot of people just concern themselves with other stuff, with partying, with like just being super focused on trying to buy a house. I think happens a lot at our generation too. Yeah. And like, they're so focused on that, that they're not really thinking about sort of like the bigger game of money that's being played around that. So, um, yeah, I think like for a lot of people, they don't really want to think about it. They're busy with their jobs, with their careers, with their relationships, with working out, with all kinds of things. And for them, it's like, it's just not top of mind. Like they've, they've seen a lot of their friends as well get into like the wider crypto space and start gambling and messing around um but they're just not as interested like they've heard about it before they feel like it's kind of past at this point and uh now they're just looking you know to keep living their life and do what it is that they're doing so it's it's tricky like you get a lot of different reactions i think what about you what's your experience been well, what I think is interesting, I, I see the same, um, but I find it just so fascinating that once I came to the realization that like, that the quality of the money influences all the choices in your life, you know, even, even subconsciously, that makes it like the most important subject that 
we should talk about and fix at the same time, right? And so people are building their careers or focusing on it, right? Or they want to try to start a family or buy a house, etc. Those are very big things, right? Those are main activities in everyone's life, basically. Mm -hmm. And also those activities are also influenced by the quality of the money. And so I think it's actually very surprising that people don't think about it because they are so connected. But on the other side, they have no clue. I, I said this many times on the podcast too. Like, uh, you know, we grew up in this country. We got some coins or some bills. We went to the bakery. We got a bread and, you know, the money works. Like there's there's nothing that you have to doubt or think about or ask about, right? And so I think it is, yeah, just kind of like how we grew up we never had to challenge it or think about it. And and I think that permeates to, you know, the adult life right now. But I cannot imagine that, uh, you know, like yesterday I went, <laughs> I went to the supermarket just to get like some dinner and something for breakfast. And it was 30 euros or 33 euros or something. And other people have to see that too and think like, that is not normal. Like It, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that when we grew yeah. up. And so... It it is within our lifetime already way different now compared to our youth. So that is actually what surprises me in, in the fact that not a lot of people actually focus on this. And I, I have the same experience as you. So yeah. that is kind of it. And and even and and this was one of my motivations to start a podcast. Like I had a week where I talked to several friends some that are really well off and they have no Bitcoin. Well, one has one Bitcoin now because I, I pushed him. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if I ask a question like, hey, if you call your bank and you want to get, you know, this this is a guy who has money, but like uh, if you want to get 100K cash out, what do you think happens, you know? And he was like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I have to wait it two days or something. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know. I get it. Maybe they ask what I'm going to use it for or something. But, you know, it's fine. Like that that type of reaction. You know, and so he sees that waiting maybe is a little nuisance, but not like a big problem. Whereas, you know, I was on the other side of this conversation and this was during a two hour car ride, actually, where I was like, but you worked really hard. You sold a company. And now if you want to get access to the reward you got, there's some random entity between you and that reward, you know, and, and the woman or the man you talk to on the mm -hmm on the phone they just have a job they have their instructions they don't really care about you and they're going to be like well what are you going to use it for sir you know like i see that as a problem you know like you don't really own what you think you own mm -hmm. but he just didn't see that hey there i want to ask you for a quick favor i noticed something interesting 75 percent of my viewers aren't subscribed yet subscribing helps me grow this channel ensuring more great content each week so if you're enjoying our conversations on Bitcoin for Millennials, please consider hitting the subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your favorite podcasting app. I'm super grateful for everyone who already joined and shared their thoughts. Your feedback really keeps me going. And I want to ask you to continue doing that. I try to respond to all the comments and also the emails that I get uh, and DMs on Twitter, etc. So don't stop doing that. I'll keep going. Now let's get back to the conversation. A lot of people yeah. have to experience that first, I think. Like there's a there's a lot of resistance, I think, especially over here, because we're we're pretty well off. Like that just causes a lot of people to be like, Yeah, it's annoying, but it's not that annoying that I'm not able to live my life and yeah. enjoy the things that I want to do. And I think beyond that, there's also a lot of people that like this kind of this this problem of money gets pushed onto their lives. Like you suddenly have to start caring about money, but a lot of people don't want to care about it to the extent of like, we have to fix this big system. That's mm -hmm. not their life mission. They want to accomplish other things or have other goals or interests. And even though they don't really want to, they suddenly get dragged into this kind of like global monetary conflict. That's just like way beyond the scope of things that they care about. Even if society forces you to care about it. And it's like increasingly forcing people into a position where you cannot leave your money idle in the bank because it's just losing value over time. And that's a very painful reality that gets pushed onto people that they like, they're just not happy with it. And they would rather stick their head in the sand to not have to deal with it. And, you know, then face reality and be like, okay, maybe I need to start becoming more financially literate, start making smarter decisions with my money 
because if I don't, then it's going to start losing its value over time. It's a very difficult reality to accept. And a lot of people will accept it a lot later than they might have wished they had in hindsight. Um, but that is the world that we're moving towards, even if you're privileged enough to live in a wealthier country. Yeah, yeah, 100%. But I think that's also what kind of like pushes me to talk about this more. Like you, I 100% agree with the concept of you have to experience the problem before you can see a solution. But if this is going to be the problem that you and I kind of see coming and envision, yep. right? Like I want to help people think about this before they actually have that problem because at that moment when they're like, oh shit, I have to get my money out of the bank, you know, ding dong, the money's not there, you know? Yeah. So, like, or, or, or you'll just yeah. be super busy because everyone suddenly wants to help at the same time. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I totally yeah. get this, I agree. I have the but same it's just view hard, it. it's, it's hard. But it, it's actually um, a few episodes back, I, I talked with Maya Parbu, who's from Suriname, and she kind of opened my eyes to the fact that, you know, I always thought that, you know, people who experience this problem already, they are probably studying Bitcoin and adopting it and trying to get out of their system, uh, you know, of the money that they're that they're forced to use. And, and, well, you kind of see that in Nigeria, for example. But then Maya told me, you know, the people here make on average like uh, $200 a month or, or $300-ish, something like that. And they're all just struggling and, and hustling to survive. They don't have time to actually think about it and study. And that kind of humbled me more, I would say, because I always thought, you know, I figured out Bitcoin without having the actual problem. Mm -hmm. I, I see the problem. I don't have the problem and I'm still acting on it, right? But that is super privileged, super, yeah. super privileged, right? And I think that's a great, that's a great realization. And it also shows that, the, and, and that's, I think, also why, we are both advocating for this. Like the people who are already experiencing the problem, they have no time to study this, right? And so, I, uh, yeah, that's kind of yeah. what I and feel very like. Often, even if they have time to study it, it is too complicated for the average person to understand why exactly the financial system is so messed up. And even if you understand every little detail about it, that still doesn't give you any influence to, to change it. And And I think like... Part of the reason why we started talking was a couple of weeks ago, I think it's been now, there was this video that went viral of like Biden's economic advisor. I yeah. was like struggling to explain how the financial system works. And, you know, all the Bitcoiners laugh at that and go like, oh, that's crazy that he can't explain it. But to be honest, for me, I'm looking at that and thinking like, it, like it doesn't even matter that much whether he would understand all of the details or not. The core principle here is that all of them are okay with how it works. Yeah. So like who exactly is printing the money, whether that's the central bank or whether it's the government or who made the exact decision for me, it's like, like, sure. In, in practice, it matters, but like, e even if everyone knew exactly who was doing that, I don't think anything would change about it. Nobody has an interest in changing that big system from the inside. Yeah. So that's essentially why we Bitcoin, because we think it's just not going to happen over there. So let's make it happen ourselves in a different kind of way. So people get kind of stuck up on that, like, oh, if these guys can't even explain it, then, uh, you know, like we've got a real problem. But even if that guy would be able to perfectly explain it, the vast majority of the global population can't replicate that explanation, can't mm. explain to the average person in a way that they're going to care how the financial system works. So that just doesn't really get us anywhere. It's like it's kind of a yeah. distraction, kind of a waste of time. I agree. Like if he would be able to explain it, he would still advocate for it. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like we need well. inflation to uh, incentivize people to spend money and yeah. grow the, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this, is a, this is a good point because I think the, I think it was Hayek who said, you know, like we have to circumvent this in like a sly about yeah. way. Right. I, I think that's what we're doing. And that's also how I see Bitcoin. Like I don't see, um, moving into Bitcoin as buying Bitcoin, I literally see it as moving, right? So I have economic energy saved in a system that, you know, is not working and I'm just moving it to a, t a totally different system. I'm literally getting on another boat or another planet almost. Yeah. yeah. So I know your introduction to Bitcoin w was through like an online game uh, economy. Can yeah. you share a bit about that experience and, and how it shaped your understanding of Bitcoin? Um, well, 
like in a way that also made me very privileged because I first learned about Bitcoin, as you mentioned, like through this online uh, economy in a game where basically you have like a lot of people know World of Warcraft. I played like kind of an equivalent of that, the second biggest game, it was called RuneScape. And it had its own trading economy in there. And similar to World of Warcraft, if you had things in that game, you could exchange it for real world money. Because you had some people who are like, you know, why am I going to spend my whole weekend trying to gather enough resources to pay for this expensive thing in the game if I just have money that I can change it for and then I have it immediately. So an economy emerged there and uh, you could basically change the value that you had in the game for real life money. The issue that you have with that is when you're trading virtual goods, you like you can't really use something like PayPal because you don't have a physical proof of the delivery that was made. So people can just charge back. So yep. in this kind of like online marketplace, you need payment methods that can just be charged back or you get tons of fraud and then the cost of trading just becomes really high. So in there, people started accepting Bitcoin gradually. Um, and that's when I first started looking into, into it, like, okay, that's interesting. And as I started learning more about it, I realized like this can be used by anyone anywhere, hence the appeal, of course. And sort of like in that whole journey, also realized that a lot of people who were uh, gathering a lot of resources in that game were in some cases from poorer countries. Because if they would spend 10 hours a day gathering resources on there and exchange that for dollars, ultimately, then they would earn like $10 a day or something, which for them was a lot of money uh, in some uh, places. There were a lot of people from Venezuela, for example, that were doing this. So that really started opening my eyes to like, as a like pretty young dude, uh, like, hold on, like not every country in the world has a well-functioning economy because there's literally people who can earn better money playing a game and gathering some stuff on there than they could like working a real job. So that kind of started making me, you know, it's like humbling in a way where you realize like, wow, uh, this is the best money these people can earn. Like there is no, not necessarily much of a future for them to be able to build up much of a career to have like financial stability and things, they need to resort to stuff like this. So uh, that really opened my eyes to a lot of things as well. I find that so interesting, right? Like that is w what we previously talked about, like not, not seeing the problem, right? But money creates incentives, right? Like we can agree on a certain value exchange and an amount for the reward, right? Like the, the number of units of a currency that, that I get, but the quality of the money determines the quality of my work also, right? So I could say one thing, but if my reward is, is bad, you know, is, is, is broken, then, you know, I'm not going to put like all the value that I could put in or, if, or, or all the energy, I, I'm not putting that into the work, right? Like I love, uh, there's these like TikToks and short videos about like these building inspectors in America and they mm -hmm. go to like newly built homes and they show how it should be done and how it is done. And it's just such poor, poor quality. Right. But, and so I think that's slowly the case up until the point, as you, I think illustrated, there are people in countries that would rather play games. They are more incentivized to play games all day than to help build homes or make food for people or, you know, do whatever is actually valuable for uh, like a community. Right. Yeah. And I, th I think there's a really extreme example of this as well. Like your, like your target audience is obviously millennials, but even younger generations in a lot of cases, like if you ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up or what would you ideally like to become? All of them want to be like streamers. Yeah. Like YouTube celebrities, TikTok celebrities, like that's, sort of idealized as this is the sort of the peak of, of what you could accomplish in the career. Yeah. So we're just seeing a, like, well, that's more related to the attention game, I think, than the money game. It's like more related to status than money necessarily. But uh, we're just seeing generations change because of digital stuff in general. Well, it's what you aspire to also, right? Because uh, there's this survey, right? Uh, uh, what you refer to in America, they say like, I want to be an influencer. And in China, they say, I want to be an astronaut or a, physical, a ph physicist or something. So, you know, it's also, it, it, it also changes that entire culture in a sense. And, and therefore also the, the society in mm -hmm. in a few years because if it feels 
if you feel way more incentivized to try to do like TikTok dances on the streets when you're 23 instead of starting uh, a physics study or master or whatever, <laughs> right? Like eventually we're going to miss some physicists and like people who can actually propel uh, the societies forward instead of oh, yeah. there, doing there's dances a, there's on the internet. A, there's a fun saying about this in the Netherlands, I think, where it's like Amsterdam is something like 200,000 marketers and... I mean, I'm one yeah. of them, so I'm one to talk, but 200,000 marketers and barely any of them can fix their own tap or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. So when when you saw that, like, and, and you look at Bitcoin now, what what are aspects of of the value proposition of Bitcoin that attracted you first and, and how do you view them now? Um, I think what attracted me first was the digital scarcity aspect. Because the game that I had played, it also had scarce digital goods in there. And that was, and they were worth a lot as a result because they would never be created again. And that for me was the thing that made it easiest for me to understand Bitcoin. Um, because it's like, it's just a thing that was in common between the game and Bitcoin itself. And for me, it just helped me understand like, okay, digital scarcity, I get. And now apparently we have a system to do that where nobody's in charge. That was the weird part to me. And the part where I felt like there's got to be some kind of catch here. Like, how could there be nobody in charge? And it took a little while for me to figure that out. But that resonated the strongest with me. Not necessarily because I saw it as like, I really want to hold this and uh, like hope that it becomes worth a lot today. But more like technologically as an invention, that seems super fascinating to me because it's not something I thought we previously had in the world. So I was mostly just interested from that perspective is like, how is this going to change the world that we live in? Like, like are people actually going to adopt this in a similar way? And are all of those kind of like economies and trading mechanics and everything that I've witnessed in my youth, are they going to replicate around this thing of the real world now? And, you know, like what kind of role can I play in that? Um, and as well, like, when I got into it, people were constantly talking about Bitcoin as a medium of exchange, like really celebrating whenever a company like Microsoft or like Newegg or all of these marketplaces uh, started being like, oh, we start accepting Bitcoin as a payment method. Like everyone was talking about that. So I was also really interested for the digital payments perspective, which is initially kind of like how I first interfaced with it uh, from trading goods in the game for real life money, as we talked about. Um, so it's really those two things for me. It's the payments aspect and just purely from a technological level. I'm not a technical person by background, but I was fascinated by how we could put something out there in the world in a real functioning way. Uh, and it seemed to be working. There were just so many questions around, like, is it going to stick around, obviously? But um, that really caught my attention. Just, just I was just really impressed. And do you view it like still the same now? Is it more proven? Or are there now also other things that, that you really see? Yeah, I think both. Uh, it's definitely more proven. Like I am, I'm less concerned that it's going to go away than I was back then. Like back then, I mean, people had no clue. Like, is this going to stick around? Is it going to be worth much? That's completely changed. Um, but nowadays, like things I'm concerned about is like, what kind of people have we gotten interested in Bitcoin? Because when I got into it initially, like, you had a lot more people who care about the privacy and the freedom aspect of it and being able to transact with anyone around the world. And it feels like nowadays we have, a like we just do, we have way more people that care about the number going up, about making a whole bunch of money. And they aren't necessarily as interested in sort of preserving the core values of the network. So I'm a little more concerned now than I was then about like, like okay, this, I'm, I'm sure now the system will continue to exist. The question I have now is like, what's it going to look like? Like it's the vast majority of people, are they only going to focus on making more money and then exchanging that for dollars or whatever? Um, or will they still care about actually switching over to a system with a limited supply? Like, is that is that for some people just like a talking point in the hopes that it will make the price go up or do they actually fundamentally care that we don't just have a small group of people that decide how many dollars there's gonna to be tomorrow or how many euros or whatever currency? Like if we lose that, Kind of like that aspect, that core principle of the network where people will just like happily grasp any narrative that accomplishes the outcome they want, which is having more money, then uh, that would be a true pity, I think. 
So that's one I'm a bit concerned about because you just see a lot of hype around price going up and a lot of people who will just watch anything happen that makes the price go up and cheer them on. Well, to be honest, I think we also have had that phase. I think a lot of people get into Bitcoin because number go up. I, I, I think it's good marketing actually, and, but it takes some time to get to, I'd say where we are, where we are now. Right. And so I think every cycle, there's this new batch of people that, that get into it mainly I'd say because number go up and, but mm -hmm. well, yeah, if, if you're curious enough and you die, you like want to understand what this is, then, well, we both know that the rabbit hole is kind of like an endless thing. Right. And, and you get into Bitcoin based on, you know, your age experience, whatever interests from, from a different dimension. So I would agree, but I think it, it also takes time to feel maybe for us that the people new to this actually, you know, go beyond uh, the number, number go up. I mean, it took me several years to, uh, yeah, I mean, to it, get I, know, there. I know it takes time for sure. Um, I'm just like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm wondering if it's going to keep happening at the same kind of rate or if yeah. less and less people will get interested in it for that reason. And then in the long term, just like what, what kind of effects will that have? Are we eventually just going to have like a, almost like a PayPal, but with the 21 million, will that be the outcome? Um, or are people going to keep trying to fight for having like proper tools that allow us to have a decentralized system? So we're kind of at a interesting point in time, I think for that with all of the regulatory conversations and people trying to figure out like, really like, how do we make this thing scale and what should be built there? So, uh, I think yeah. we live in a super interesting time for it. Like, I'm glad we're no longer wondering, like, is this thing going to get banned or limited somehow? And it's much more like how, you know, what shape is it going to take moving forward? Yeah. Um, I think my view didn't really change that much on it. I, I always saw Bitcoin as like a zero or everything thing, <laughs> you know, like fair. there's no, there, I, I don't see a world where Bitcoin ends up in like this in between phase or, or, or like, uh, yeah, and ends up at, at, as some mediocre store value asset. I think the arguments for that are super clear. I think the finite supply, provable finite supply is the main thing. Uh, everything yep. else where you could store wealth in, uh, can be created. And, um, of those things, more of those things can be created. Right. So, Therefore, Bitcoin is superior in that sense. But uh, yeah, so I always thought it's either zero or like, you know, what some people say, the black hole value, like everything, everyone's going to store their productivity, the reward for their productivity in, in Bitcoin. I think I, what I, is I would agree, yeah. uh, but, but I would mostly credit that or mo like a, a large part of that I would credit to the fact that we just know that they'll keep printing fiat currencies. Mm -hmm. And not necessarily to Bitcoin. It's like, I mean, Bitcoin's design just needs to be what it is for yeah. a lot of the store of value to move over to it. Like it just needs to continue to not screw up for that to happen. So I yeah. agree with you on the, like the store of value sense. I just like, even from a store of value perspective, I'm just concerned that in the long run, the vast majority of people would just store their money on an exchange um, or with some kind of custodian and like everything fully KYC and controlled by the government, uh, governments rather. And I just wonder like what implications is that going to have? Like once they really start screwing up so hard that they just don't know where to get the money to pay off their debts. That's where I start wondering, like, are they going to start touching those exchanges and like collecting bigger and bigger taxes from yeah. people who store their value in Bitcoin? And are we then kind of like back to where like, I guess, I guess like back to where we are now in the sense that, you know, they're just able to touch all of the assets so they can keep printing and just taking more money from the people. Yeah. That's a bit, like, it's a bit of a dark, gloomy view, but it's just something that I think about and I'm concerned about yeah. um, because we're trying to get away from that point where they can just like right now they're confiscating mass amounts of wealth from people through inflation. But if at that point they can just directly take it from people's Bitcoin accounts, uh, but, then yeah. I would agree. I think this is the biggest challenge. 
what I would say is that the inflation is covert in some, yeah. well, to some degree. Super true. You know, it's, it's, it's covert. And a lot of people have been led to believe that it's necessary and normal and blah, blah, like, like all these things. Right. And I think the confiscation, you know, like, like the gold confiscation, um, um, you know, as a, as the prime example also was in a time where information was way more scattered. Right. And so I, I think it's good to look at the past to see what could happen, but in t doing that exact thing in 2024 is never going to fly. I think it, it just doesn't work like that. You know, that overtly doing that in, in such an open fashion, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's going to fly. There's also, well, we see what political, you know, power this brings in a sense, you know, with, with the votings in, in the Congress, like uh, in, the, in, the, in the past two weeks, this has now become a thing. And I I agree with you that this is the biggest challenge. Like, how are we going to overcome the fact that governments will come for the Bitcoin? You know, I think that mm -hmm. is very clear. But I think if we zoom out a bit more, I think conceptually, so I don't know how it's going to work, but I feel like there's going to be a power shift towards the Bitcoiners in a sense, right? Because... Uh, if a tax person is going to investigate a Bitcoiner and they say like, well, I got your KYC uh, Coinbase account here. You bought this, you stored it there. You know, you took it off Coinbase to this wallet. Now you have to pay. And then when you say, you know, I lost it in a boating accident and they talk to a hundred Bitcoiners that all say that, there's going to be an interesting moment where they're going to sue someone, I'd say, yeah. right? And they're going to be like, well, Sam, you're fucked. <laughs> you know, you have this amount of Bitcoin and you're going to have to pay. And you say, I am not in a possession of these Bitcoin. And that's going to be, an, it, it's like the most classic power struggle. It's like a he said, she said, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be a person that's going to go to court and they're going to say, I just don't have access. I don't know. Yeah. Right. And then the government's going to say, well, you should share your password. And then we'll, we'll be at the lowest point of the lowest point, which is they're going to compel speech, which no judge is going to be in favor of, I would say. I would mm -hmm. argue. But I mean, with the ETH ETF, we've seen uh, things, <laughs> you know, can go different. But this is so public. It, it, it's 2024. It's so public, right? And, and I, I fully and, agree with everything and, you're saying. So I, I think would... that that is really the, the thing. It's so public and so transparent. And Bitcoin is a worldwide movement or community, right? Mm -hmm. There's very powerful and influential people that are also already Bitcoiners. They're also in the Senate, you know, all, all these things. Like So it, it permeates to all these individuals. And so the collectives that are trying to you know, assert this, this power in different ways, I, I, they will slowly be, be broken up. That doesn't change the fact that America will probably and desperately look for, you know, funds to pay for their, for their interests, you know. But yeah, that's kind of how I view it. I mean, I fully agree with, with everything you said there, but I would like maybe to nuance what I previously said. I'm not, I'm not saying they will specifically like, like necessarily tax you directly and just overtly take the money. They can also just run the same game that they've run for a long time, which is just starting to run fractional reserves on exchanges. Mm. And if you're in a scenario where, let's say, like all the miners are KYC, so you can't send like, and they decide who gets to send money or not, um, which is like again, this is like it's a hypothetical scenario. But if you get to that point where all the miners are, or the vast majority of them are very much controlled, and the exchange even decides whether you're allowed to withdraw or not, then it can get a bit tricky where people can't move their money off an exchange so easily. And if they can move it off an exchange or only from one to another, but the government basically says the way we're going to collect these taxes is just by forcing the exchange to inflate the supply, like to pretend that there's Bitcoin there that isn't actually mm. there. And all you're holding are numbers on this one exchange that you're using or on another exchange. But across the system, we start going beyond the 21 million. So for me, like the, the point I'm trying to say is like, 
I think the like sort of the core values of Bitcoin, the ability to freely transact, they're they're almost intertwined with that 21 million because the moment that stops existing and we all just keep our money at Bitcoin Bank, so to speak. And like I'm hoping like a way to counteract that, for example, is having like proper proof of reserves and proof of liabilities and all of this stuff that can help yeah. a lot there. But that's not really something we're seeing happen in practice with most exchanges today. Yeah. Um, and even when they do proof of reserves, there's no proof of liabilities and just all kinds of other questions around that. So that's just a bit of a like an, un, an unanswered direction of like, yeah. are we properly covering that to make sure we don't get in those kinds of issues? Yeah, I'd say last last reply to that. I, I also agree. I think I, I think they could try it. But one of the things that I think is really great about Bitcoin is that we can force this transparency, right? Like, as you said, like proof, proof of reserves. I think it's just one thing. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fair point. Eventually these are also businesses, right? So if, if there are exchanges that, that would not comply with this, you know, ask for transparency, then customers should be able to move if they are then blocked, et cetera. Right. Like, I mean, this is my, my entire thing like that, that, I don't know if that's going to happen, man. Because it's just so it's know. just so it's just so public, right? So if you're a public traded, if Coinbase is gonna halt Bitcoin withdrawals, they have a real huge problem. Huge I think problem. I think so too, but yeah. I, I would like yeah. caveat that by saying I think by that point the world will also have changed quite significantly. And 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 the part that I guess like back to our discussion of like what kind of responses do you get when you talk to millennials, for example, is like I, I think we're potentially going to move towards a world where like the people who are interested in Bitcoin, they're largely in and a lot of the rest of the population feel like they've just missed out. And we're now trying to get them in to be able to offload our Bitcoin or whatever, which is like, if you talk to an actual Bitcoiner, we don't want to do that. We want to keep as no. much as possible. We don't want to share it. We just care about the people around us. And that's why we share it. But, but I that think that point illustrates why we need to talk about this, because just uh, that thought is totally. such a fiat zero sum game thought. Yeah. Right. That's what. Sorry for the boomers, but a lot of like boomer critics, especially in our country, will be like, yeah, you know, you want to get me into Bitcoin because then you can dump it on me. Like dump for what, dude? Like the entire reason I have Bitcoin is that I yep. don't like the our political currency. Like that that's the entire point. So that shows they don't understand, but it also shows still that the people who listen to that also are not thinking for themselves and they don't understand, you know, and well, then we get back to the beginning when we talked about, you know, I think we are both feel the urge to talk about this more. And yeah, of course, like some people are going to get it and some people are not going to get it. Um, now I get lots of messages, to be honest, from all sorts of people. Last mm -hmm. week I got a message from a guy who is a, a high school teacher and he and his wife, uh, he, he messaged me like a year ago or something also about Bitcoin. And then he was like, yeah, I'm going to trade a bit and this and that. I said, I'll, I'll, just let me know how that goes and I'll, I'll hear from you. Right. And then like yep. six months ago or something, he sent me a message. So he's also, he's like 33, I think 34 or something like that. And he sent me a message. He's like, yeah, you were right. I'm a shit trader. I cannot compete. Uh, I panic sold Bitcoin. Now I have less Bitcoin than before. Right. So he, he went through it. And then like last week, he sent me a message. He's like, yeah, me and my girlfriend have this crazy idea. We're going to sell everything we have, sell our house. We're going to travel around the world with our child. Um, I'm going to have 500K cash. How would you approach this, uh, you know, buying Bitcoin and, and living off? And I'm like, damn, you know, like that's one year. Yeah. The one year of this high school teacher guy who went through this entire learning curve, you know. And, and so it is happening. People are are starting to think for themselves from all levels um, of, of society, I'd say. And so I think it is happening, but it's a slow thing because it's, it's you know, like, I like the mind virus concept, you know, like it is that. Yeah, and and I, th I think so too. Like I'm not saying Bitcoin's not going to grow, but I think like a large number of the people at this point, like it's existed for 15 years, a large number of the people who are, like kind of like intellectually curious about it. Mm. Like I'd say a pretty big portion is already in at this point and the rest will have more and more resistance. So then my concern is kind of like moving towards the future. Uh, as things get more dire financially for everyone, 
people will start yeah. finding scapegoats for like, where can we now get the money to pay for the situation we've gotten ourselves in? And they'll try to pit us against them in a way or yeah. for them against well, us. Yeah. Well, that, that's also one point I wanted to make is that when I said like power is going to also shift to Bitcoiners, I think also Balaji talks about this a lot. Yeah. You know, he eventually goes to, you know, well, then you just move, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think a lot of people would actually want to move. Totally agreed. But the... The the the, um, the the power projection of you know government towards people or people towards the government I, I I do think like that can shift right because even though if you know I, I don't see uh, hyper Bitcoinization as you know like an entire country on a Bitcoin standard I I don't I I just don't think that will be practical but having like a Bitcoin backed currency where you actually um, follow the entire ethos of Bitcoin and being ultra transparent, proof of reserves and on all these things, right? And if you can have like a paper currency on top of that, mm -hmm. I think that is fine because then you have Bitcoin as the base layer asset that forces the transparency of the, you know, the well, then it's kind of like, no, that's not fiat, but like the, the, the paper currency, yeah, I know what you, you know. I, I kind of see that model being... A possibility. Yeah, like more than only Bitcoin. Yeah. I, I would say that that is probably... And, and yeah, I would that, agree, like, yeah. maybe to nuance the stuff I've said as well is, like, I remain optimistic about Bitcoin. And, like, I'm, I'm just hopeful that the worst case scenario we end up with would be that, like, you know, we enforce a 21 million and people will try to mess with that. And whether they'll succeed or not is, you know, that's a big question well, mark. You can mess with that now. You can yeah. start your Bitcoin, Sam, whatever. So Yeah. Well, well, more like in the sense of like try to dilute it via exchanges and whatnot. And uh, kind yeah. of like, yeah. like SBF with FTX. They also ran this whole yeah. model and it goes on for a while. Uh, they just went a little too extreme with it. If they wouldn't have been in it as extreme, maybe it would have gone on for a decade for all you know. Uh, until people found out, oh, actually the Bitcoin isn't there. So... Uh, like in yeah, general, but, like but I, also I'm, if if we get more wealthy or Bitcoiners get more wealthy and more influential, and it looks like you know Coinbase as a random example is cooking the books, you know, and and they have paper Bitcoin. I don't know who said this, but I I believe it. Like Bitcoiners that gain power are also incentivized to protect Bitcoin, right? So it's like it's, it's it's like a nice loop, and so there will be people that will sue Coinbase. Right and force them to be be actually transparent and show all these things. Like that is, I think the main point I would follow is the fact that you know banks are cooking books and you had the whole two thousand eight financial crisis. All you know everything is abstracted and obscured and all these things and general population has no clue. They still don't understand it. You know, yep. if the base layer asset is Bitcoin, that is just going to be way way more difficult. <laughs> I totally, see, yeah. You know. and, and this to so, me is yeah. one of the most fascinating things about Bitcoin is because what we're seeing in the fiat system, it's like to your point earlier, it's all incentives. Like if mm. we recreated a financial system from scratch, we'd get a lot of that same stuff all over again. And it's now that we're introducing this one base rule that people can't change through their opinions or, or mistakes or whatever it is that they've uh, done to make them do things they should not be doing. Like, that's really what's interesting to me. And I really wonder in general, like that's part of my interest in Bitcoin is does that principle hold up? Like, is it strong yeah, enough to fight back against human stupidity over decades and over centuries uh, to really fundamentally change the way society works? And I'm very hopeful that it does. That's a big part of why I'm so fascinated by Bitcoin. Um, I just like, sometimes I, I feel like a lot of Bitcoiners take it for granted. Like that's how stuff is going to play out. I agree. And I'm sure someone will like, oh, if, if a government's too oppressive, I'm sure loads of Bitcoiners will move. And then to your point, a lot of them actually don't end up moving. It's more like, it's more like a talking point to feel good about if, if things get bad, then I'm sure I'll move out. But then in practice, it's like they're non Bitcoiner family and friends. They don't want to move. So then they also don't want to move. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of people just end up staying where they are. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm constantly trying to figure out like, how many of the arguments that we use when we say Bitcoin's going to succeed, how many of them we, do we actually believe and are actually happening versus how many of them are things people like to believe because they sound good and give them hope about the future and uh, all of that kind of stuff. 
So I think it's yeah. it's a super interesting development. I think part of it is hope. On the other side, I think you know what lots of people in Bitcoiners will talk about is like once if we fix the the, the base layer right of of yeah. the of the value or or what represents value in an economy, if we fix that and it's ultimately transparent, then like incentive number one is the purest incentive right if 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 you get the re the reward right does that make sense like, like yeah, yeah like incentive number 1 of a whole chain of things that people do right and if you want to do something for me and your reward's going to be bitcoin i can force you to do the best you can or be the most transparent as you can be right or else i'm just not going to pay you for your service or your or your product and i think just like how now people are subconsciously complying to something they don't understand. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they will understand Bitcoin better later on, right? And I think we are both trying to, to add to that. But complying is easier than trying to figure out how can I go uh, against this, right? So I, I do also see that in like human behavior, right? That it's like, okay, well... Uh, I'm forced to actually do the work that I promised to do for yeah. you. Okay, well, I guess I'm going to do that. You know, yeah. so I I, I love yeah. that aspect, and that's really interesting. About I think like all the stuff Jeff Booth says around like a deflationary world, how you have economists who complain about that that it doesn't function. I'm like on the other hand, I'm like you know pretty damn exciting to see a world in which everyone's like like we have to all work a bit harder or like like put in our best effort to make quality things and to not cut corners and everything the fiat thinking as you would probably call it um i i really like that aspect of it too and seeing like where does that take society if we can really like embed that kind of incentive system in the mm. world uh i think we can accomplish wonderful things the question is like to what to what extent can we can we embed it like how far does that grow where it becomes such a large force that just more and more people start thinking that way. Like I want to get up every day and I want to build something. I don't make, I want to make my surroundings, yeah. my community and everything better than they are now. I think, yeah, I'm hundred percent aligned with this. I think that if you are happier with what you do to earn rewards in an economy, right. And you're proud of what you do, then that will show in your life, right? Like there's so many people who are stuck in bullshit jobs or, you know, all, all these things, or they create, you know, there's people who, who create like, uh, you know, sucky plastic toys in some sort of factory. Like, are you, are you like, does that make you happy? Like, no, you know? And, and so I think eventually if, and of course this is kind of utopian for some people, but I believe like if, if the incentives are really aligned and people are more happy with what they contribute to society, right? Like, or we're going to build like crazy buildings again, right? Or, yeah. you know, like these statues that they had in Greece, like overlooking the harbors or whatever. Like if you are, if you, if you can be proud of um, contributing to that, you know, that will rub off on other people. Yeah. Because if you are sad and you see another person who is happy and content with himself and the world and whatever, you know that that is inspiring. Definitely, I would and say and this is and yeah, totally. That's the example this is, we also should give. I, yeah, you know. and and if we look at other millennials, like so many millennials are like kind of hopeless about the future, and like they they you know they feel like I won't be able to have my own house and actually afford that. Climate change is like a big deal, and it it's like a very gloomy outlook on the future. And that's the message I tried to bring to Bitcoin. Uh, sort of like through Bitcoin as well to people. It's like, it's not necessarily about the money. It's how you look at the future. And like, you know, I want to talk because I just like kind of painted a potential scenario in which I'm not as optimistic about how things play out. But in general, I do try to think of it as like, how is this going to change your life and the ability to take ownership of your life and actually make something of it. Yeah. And like, I think good to mention with what you said as well. It's like a lot of people hear that and think like, yeah, but in which world is everyone going to be happy? But you're not suggesting, you know, it's not a binary thing where it's all or nothing. It's just a larger percentage of people will love what they do when the right incentives are in place. And that's still 100%. not going to be, still not going to be everyone. It might not even be half the people, but an yeah. improvement over where we are today. But that argument is so empty. 
it's like you, you are a part of you know one half of that conversation and you are positive and you have a positive outlook etc yeah yeah but uh, not everyone can be happy eventually yeah okay but that is not like like no one is going to solve your happiness yeah so it, it it's I've become a, become a bit allergic for like those types of things. It's like, uh, and, and it's actually one of the things I wanted to ask you, you know, like uh, I often talked with, with like guests on, on the podcast with uh, Tomer, Strolight or Eric Case and how, um, you know, Bitcoin turns nihilism into optimism. I think that is exactly what we are talking about, right? Yeah. But, like comments like that, they are like, those are nihilistic, right? Like the, the, the we are so wired into this, like, yeah, yeah, the zero sum game. Like, if I win, you lose. If someone wins, other people lose, etc. That is what I think is the seed of like comments like that. Mm -hmm. It's right? like a mind virus. Yeah, right. So, but like, do you experience this a lot in your social circle, like the, the nihilism? Yeah, you get it. Um, and I, I find it super interesting to deal with every single time because you can. There are a lot of interesting ways in which you can disarm it because people immediately like they try to put Bitcoin in a certain box or they they try to introduce certain arguments like, yes, but I heard on the news that this or that or that scam happened or thing. Mm. And there's a lot of arguments that you could typically use to kind of like they're very negative about it. I'm not trying to turn them into a Bitcoin believer or someone who's super positive about it, but to, but to just neutralize that argument and show them that the facts don't back up what they're thinking or seeing. Which in, for a lot of people, it's it's like a bit of a shock. Like, oh, you're not trying to convince me. You're just telling me that what I currently know about this thing isn't right. And yeah. if you do that a couple times over, in a lot of cases, people start becoming a bit more like mindful about what they think about things. And that's like, I think a big part of the nihilism is people who just repeat what they hear elsewhere Yeah, to be able to explain to others and to be interesting uh, about how they see the world and what they know about the world. But um, like kind of like pushing back against that, but not in a way where you tell them, I know even better than you, but that can work with some people. So I, I definitely see a bunch of it, but I don't try to fight those people and like start arguments and, and try to convince them of something different. I only try to show them that like what it is that they're currently so stuck on. Like, you know, you can even ask them the question like, okay, even if you think this is true, Just even why? if you think all of, all of Bitcoin is a scam or whatever, like, do you then think that over a trillion dollars in value is in this and all those people think it's a scam? Do you think yeah. all these big investors are involved, all these big companies, because they've all just been fooled? Um, yeah. And if that's and you, true... And you are not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you are not. And if that's true, yeah. what can we do about that? Yeah. I, and then you, you get into yeah. very interesting discussions with people because then they also don't know. They're like, wait, you're agreeing with me? Uh, oh, damn, like, like now I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Like, I guess we can just yeah. move on and talk about the weather or something. I think that is also my main goal is I want to show them that I just ask why. Why do you say this? Yeah, because uh, someone uh, blah, blah, blah said. I said, well, did, but did you verify it, right? Like, did you? So I'm just asking questions. And I think my main goal is to get them to a point where they realize that what they think is their opinion it, is not based on their own thinking, right? Like it's based on on something they heard. And then I kind of like turn it around and say like, for example, people that know me for a long time, I say like, okay, well, you know me for a long time. You, I think you know I'm a diligent risk averse person mm -hmm. and I'm curious. And perhaps you could also be thinking like, why is my friend 91% in Bitcoin? You could also ask the curious question instead of, posing this opinion, you know, whatever, yep. you're just trying to get me in because then it goes up, blah, blah. And then if I say, yeah, I don't really care, <laughs> I'm good. You know, that, that, that already, I think that's a fun game. And then you don't even have to talk about Bitcoin specifically. I think it's more about kind of like showing them that how they are thinking is, is not, not a conscious thing. Right. And I, I think to what, what we just talked about, um, I just want to show like how it improved my life and my clarity of thinking and my happiness and, and all these things, right? And yeah, why I'm spending time on it. So I'm just trying to set that example and yeah, kind of like challenge them to reflect on why on they are thinking, life, what yeah. they are thinking. 
You Which know, for a lot of people it. is very confrontational, actually, because they like they don't, they're, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, they're blaming something else. They're talking about how something else is messed up. And then you kind of yeah. like you deflect that in a way where it points back to them. And they're like, they will immediately get defensive or like much more pushy about it. Yeah. And that's why it's so important whenever you do this stuff. And I'm, I can already tell from the way you speak and behave that in general, you remain calm. And that just makes such a big difference because a lot of people, when they're at odds about a topic, one of them will start raising their voice or getting more and more upset or mm. the arguments get more but and more outrageous. But that's the signal. That's the signal that yeah. if you're triggered, you're not with yourself. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, hundred percent people, people are confronted with that. And that is what is hard. It's not the subject that we're talking about. It's the yeah, fact that totally. someone else can show you that you're not thinking for yourself that's not nice <laughs> you know that's not a nice uh, experience and I, I i yeah i i totally understand that and that's also why i think it takes a few years you know with regards to you know what is money and inflation and finance and then eventually bitcoin is that like it takes a few years because it's not nice to realize that you are participating in a system that you have no fucking clue about how it works. Like that is yeah. not, it's just not nice to realize that. And that is okay. I think everyone in Bitcoin had that exact same yeah. experience. Right. But I, I think then eventually it's about what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. You know, and once you understand that the things you thought were true, were not true, then you have a, a big choice. To make yeah it, say, how far right? how far do you want to take that and that then well, becomes a really interesting or uh, do you want to conform experiment. to what it is and not pay any attention to it you know and keep complaining about what other people do and blah blah like that is yeah yeah i use the word matrix a lot but that's the steak of the matrix right yeah. like i want to keep eating the steak you know, that's fine but that's eventually that's not a that's not a happy life it's not a yeah. conscious life right and um, this is something i've been noticing a lot like like how can you describe a bitcoiner and like how can you identify people who aren't bitcoiners yet but would actually be interested in it and for me this is a very common theme is like who actually wants to make something out of their life who wants to take ownership of their life mm -hmm. and like make a better life for themselves rather than what you're saying like the constant complaining or just blaming other things for issues but never really doing anything about it and that for me is increasingly becoming a thing i'm looking at it's like it can be in a different area where you just see someone who's like, okay, instead of just following the system and doing what I'm expected to do and gradually paying more for everything in my life and gradually becoming unhealthier with all of the crap that gets thrown into your food, um, just taking steps yourself to start improving things. It's a very common theme within Bitcoiners as well. And it doesn't need to be like you take full financial ownership of your life and you change up everything about it so that you're fully self-sovereign and everything. But it's kind of where it starts for a lot of people. It's just that spark where you can tell that someone isn't just following all of the news and accepting everything they're being told there. Um, like that's a really big shift. I think it's like a first thing I try to identify in people. Is there an area in which they are already trying to take ownership of their lives or are they just following the system the way it's kind of like played out and been designed? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, I I love this topic, you know, because Same. I think I I think you can find and research and and understand like how uh, Bitcoin works, but f figuring out why you should adopt it <laughs> that's way harder, <laughs> you know, like that personal journey. And so I also I love more like the philosophy and like spiritual angle of adopting bitcoin a lot because well I, and i think we are we are talking about it right like that personal challenge i think is the main thing that we probably should also talk about and show and be empathetic about right and show that we had this same journey it's not looking down on people it's just showing like okay if you take that little scary leap it's going to free your mind and when it free your minds you know your life gets better like it's yeah it's it, it is that simple but it's not uh, easy yeah it's yeah. simple in hindsight like once you can look back at sort of with clarity and understand the path that you've walked then it makes yes. sense but when you look forward it's like like people are throwing complicated technical terms at me and you know i see a lot of people lose their money doing all kinds of crypto stuff and 
people don't know the difference between Bitcoin and crypto. So they don't understand like you are way further on that path and you're looking back and you're seeing a very different road than they are. And as a Bitcoiner, it's so critical to be that far in the road and never forget what it was like standing earlier in that journey. And all of Bitcoiners, because they've heard the same stories and arguments and read all these books and watched all these videos, they are so far along that they lose touch with having that empathy for someone so early in their journey. And that's something yeah. I try to push myself every single day as part of my job to not lose track of because it's so critical to be able to have a conversation with the average person and help them through, the, like get started on their journey or learn more about it. Yeah, I, I, I love that you say that because that is actually, you know, uh, the example of the, of the teacher guy who was in my DM, like, I feel like I want to tell him, like, just don't do it, but I'm not, you know, don't go into the shit coins, don't do the trading and blah, 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 because I know how it's going to end up. Right. And it's funny that it, it, it was a good feeling that I was proven right, that he came back to me. And I love that he came back to me, actually, because that 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 is actually that's, uh, that's the huge really signal. nice feedback. And that's a big signal. Right. He's like, OK, you were right. But I think like this in general, you cannot tell this to people and they will be like well okay bram or some says it so then i'm not gonna do, i'm not gonna do it like they're gonna be like yeah f you i'm, I'm gonna do this anyway like it, it, it is interesting that it just really works like that but i find it hard sometimes especially with people that i know and like or love to be like yeah you know you yeah sorry but you have to figure it out so you know i'm open to questions but i know i cannot I, I cannot change your mind. So yeah, just if you're curious enough, try to figure it out. Let me know if you have questions and then I'm happy to spend hours to answer the questions, right? But yeah. just that first part is, yeah, I mean like, the, yeah, it's just, it's just part of it. So we talked a bit about, you know, like also, you know, moving from one system to another. I kind of see Bitcoin not as investing with risk, but I see it as saving in, right? So mm -hmm. you have a job or a venture, you earn a reward for for your output. You can save that in fiat money or you can save that in Bitcoin. I, I, I see the fiat money as risky and I'm saving in into Bitcoin. How has this changed for you? Like how, how did you first view risk or did you even perceive risk? Uh, like, what is your approach to risk with, with regards to, to financial um, things? Um, well, when I first got into Bitcoin, I was, a, I was just kind of like starting my studies. And at the, like as a student, you don't really have a lot of money. And you also think from like, I was very much centered on like, I have certain skills. I'm going to be expanding those skills a lot over the next while. Um, and I don't have much money anyway. So even if I lose the money that I have at this point, then I'll like, I'm privileged enough, fortunately, that that's not going to be a problem for me. And I'll be able to build that up and just like go be a waiter or wash dishes or whatever it is I need to do to, to make enough money, which fast forward to now, if I was in a position again, I don't know if that would be enough to pay for a life living in the country that I live in because it's just freaking expensive now. Um, but back then, like I was fortunate enough to not have to worry as much about risk. But at the same time, I was looking at like the way I've kind of always looked at the financial system and a Bitcoin is like, if I put 10,000 euros or dollars or whatever currency in the bank, like how much faith do I have that in 10 years from now, it's going to be there and it's still going to have as much purchasing power versus if I put it into Bitcoin, how much faith do I have that I will still own that amount of Bitcoin in that period of time? and that it will be worth the same or less or more than it is now. And when you weigh those two things against each other and you know, well, the fiat currency in the bank will definitely devalue, there is no scenario I can imagine in which it will become worth more than it is now. So knowing that, um, it, like you're, you can already kind of like subtract a big part of that value and it's like that money is gone anyway. So if, if for example, you have 10,000 euros, <laughs> yeah. And you know that in 10 years from now, like it will lose 3000 of its value or whatever. Then you can already say, well, so like semi risk free, kind of like a stupid example, but you could just put that money into Bitcoin already because you lost it anyway. If you're, if your alternative plan is to put it in the bank. And then a lot of people will say, yeah, but you shouldn't think that way because you know, you can invest it in stocks and assets and do all kinds of things with it. 
but the average person is not a like a, a an investor they're not a cfo in their personal life so i think your metaphor of like you're just saving in this is much more sensible than trying to turn people into investors which a lot of people they don't really want to be they get forced into being more of an investor yeah. and i yeah. think this is really interesting in uh like peter mccormack did a couple of uh documentaries in countries like Lebanon and Argentina. And when you hear from the people there, they're like, everyone here is forced to be a financial expert, like a CFO over their own lives. Because if you're not like, like you just can't live, you have to spend tons of time understanding, like what are the market rates between your local currency and a dollar, for example, and like, how can I protect my purchasing power? So people get forced into that direction, even if they don't want to be. And that I think is like, we're still like in first world countries, we're less pressured that way. But when I look at the US, for example, people there are much more financially lit literate because they kind of have to be like, it's it's hard for a lot of people there. A lot of people live paycheck to paycheck, uh, which is also the case in Europe. But I think potentially, I don't know the numbers, but it might be a bit less. But in the US, lots of people live paycheck to paycheck. So they have to be super conscious about like where all the money is going and how it is that mm -hmm. they're saving it. So I, 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 like, I think about this a lot, like for me personally, I'm, you know, I'm fortunate enough to not think of risk as like, this is like existential. If I don't protect my money and I lose this money, then I'm going to be in big trouble. I won't be able to afford my bills and I'm done for, but for a lot of people, that's the kind of thinking that they need to have. So for them investing in something that the entire world tells them is risky, like Bitcoin, um, it's just too big of a leap if they're in that kind of position. Um, if you're not in that kind of position and you have some savings, then you can make the, you know, the relatively easy thought experiment of if I just keep it in the bank, then I know it's definitely going to lose its money. And that's the way I view Bitcoin similar to you is it just doesn't seem like a great plan to keep it there. Uh, so what else can I do then? And it doesn't have to be, okay, that means I'll put everything in Bitcoin. But it's just that that one realization that keeping it in the bank and doing nothing with it, that is definitely a bad plan. That's where yeah. I tend to start. Well, and, and people then think I need to invest. No, the problem is you cannot save anymore. So you yes. first save and then invest what, what you can actually lose, right? And I had uh, Peter Dunworth on, uh, on the podcast, I think uh, second episode. And he said, you know, my full-time job is to figure out what people should be doing with their money right as a as a financial advisor he's like that's my job yeah i spend the, the entire day each day on this right and m the fact that people are forced to emulate that job besides their normal job when they get home like that is the actual problem like you have a job but you don't know you have it <laughs> you know yep. when you come home from taking risk by having a certain type of job or a certain type of venture like that is risk because you're spending your your time and energy on you know working for a certain company that someone else controls or you try your own company in a certain market right and so you are taking risk anyway but then when you get home you're forced to take more risk right and i think that is where that that pressure to invest comes from people think they have to invest um but they don't understand that they are they they think that because they cannot save in the currency that that they're paid in right but i i heard you talk before about like scams and stuff so how how do you you know in your opinion like how does that pressure to invest and the threat of scams like impact our i would say generation mm -hmm. you know our outlook on financial stability and the future does is is that where the nihilism comes from you think um i think like those people prey on the nihilism because you see a lot of people that like this is part of why crypto in general is so big because people feel like well i missed out on bitcoin so now i need to find a new way to 100x my money mm. and even if historically like bitcoin would return them like 60 70 percent per year or something that's not enough because they want to turn their 1000 or 5000 or 20000 or whatever it is into a 100x or it's for them it's like just not worth playing around with and they don't have in some ways they don't have the patience to build something up over the long run or they don't have the self confidence or belief that they're able to get to a point where they can live a more comfortable life and not have to work stress and worry about the money as much 
So then that feeds into all of these people that promise them the next big thing that will make them a ton of money. And people think like, well, I'll never be able to afford a house anyway. I'll never be able to do this or that or that. So I might as well just take the risk with the little money that I have in the hopes that it's going to uh, make me a whole lot. And that is like the true shame. Like I think like the true pity that I see with, with our generation is that you have a lot of people who kind of lose hope in the long run and start taking stupid risks and lose their money that way. And then just like lump Bitcoin in with all of crypto yeah. and uh, blame all of that stuff. So that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really sad to see, I think. And I really hope that more and more of those people will start realizing like, this is to your point earlier, like go ahead and trade and you'll see that it's just not gonna, really going to work out for the like 90% plus of the people. Um, yeah. It would be nicer if we can educate people before they pay their fee to the scammers. Uh, Very difficult. I'd yeah, say. it is. Yeah, it really but is. This is the high time preference that Safety No Moose talks about, right? Like discounting the future even more, right? The future is uncertain anyway, but you can, you know, your mind can help you make it even more uncertain, and therefore, you know, you're you're gonna gamble now. Because yeah, if you don't have any hope, then you know why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you gamble? You know, and therefore yeah. I think like for me like that is a, a very big topic. Why I think this is a spiritual battle. Totally. How crazy that your spirit is crushed. Your spirit towards the future is crushed. And especially as a millennial, if you want to, you know, build a family, or some people decide not not to build a family because yeah. of that. You know, wow. Yeah, because they can't afford it, or because yeah. they. They think like I already live a bad life. Then my kids can my exactly. kids gonna be off even worse. Yeah, but then that realization. Yeah, I, I shared this before too. I sometimes say that because well, you know, for people that <laughs> that listen to uh, to most episodes. But I had a conversation with a guy, CTO of a company. Um, think a bit older. I think he's super intelligent. Uh, he understood everything about the bad money. He stood, understood everything about Bitcoin. He didn't have any Bitcoin. Um, he said like, yeah, I just don't think, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't trust that the incentives will be aligned. I still think people are going to misuse it, etc. blah, blah. So eventually, and so this was a, a real life conversation. We were sitting at the table and I asked him like, well, don't you have kids? And he's like, no, no, but that's also the reason. And then I thought like, wow, you know, this was the first experience yeah. for me yeah. actually having that conversation with someone in real life, not reading about it or seeing some TikTok or whatever, right? Like an actual conversation with someone who I regard as an intelligent, curious person. And that was really like what he decided. And that was very saddening to experience, I'd say, like in that conversation. And then I also asked him like, okay, but with all due respect, like, so you just gave up? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, that's crazy. That's just, yeah. It's so far away from how I feel, you know, but it's also real. You know, it's his, yeah. it's his experience, you know, his, um, his, oh, his map of the world, right? And, and how he views it. And I don't know, man, like, I don't know. I find that so saddening. You know, it is. Yeah. Even when you're already there, where you see the problem, you see a possible solution and you still don't have enough yeah, I think it is hope, right? I think we talked about challenges, you know, that Bitcoin could face and with people that are going to be in charge and blah, blah, but we cannot predict the future 100%. So you always have to have a little hope that, you know, eventually we will figure it out. And if not, then not, you know, like yeah, you cannot change that anyway, right? Yeah. So you better try. This yeah. is our best shot, man, is, is what I, I think. I think so, yeah. But also the fact, this is something I would think about this week, like, the fact that we are living in this moment in time is absolutely wild. Yeah. That is really hard to realize, right? The, the the falling of a certain empire, the monetization of an asset that that no one has ever experienced before, such such a huge discovery, right? And and changes also in the world that like everything we look at to to create a uh, like a benchmark for our perspective right now is so far away in the future or in the past that it doesn't feel real i would say right like it doesn't feel real that that we could also live in this moment in time but then like last week someone told me like there will there 
there were people living in the Great Depression. There were people living during the, the First and Second World War, like just like us, that, the same, same type yeah. of people with the same dreams and hopes and feelings and all, and all these things, right? And that's just fascinating to think about that, that, yeah, in some way, yeah, well, not in some way, but we are here at this time when that stuff is happening, right? This is not the 70s and not the early 80s or the 60s. Like it's, it's it a is, distinct kind of time period. Yeah. Exactly. It's very, very different, right? And, and yeah, I don't know. I feel optimistic about that, actually. Like it's, uh, it, I, I think if you can really see the problems that are there and you feel that, that you can contribute to the solution in some way, that is a really good feeling. I think that so too. some yeah. purpose. Right? And, I, and I hope in general, like to, to some of my points earlier, like a lot of Bitcoiners take this for granted and they feel like they're spectators now, but you're not a spectator, you're a participant, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can make stuff happen too. And a lot of people don't know like where to start or how to do that. Um, doesn't matter, I'd say, what you yeah, do. But like, just yeah, you something. Fig figure it out, yeah. yeah. Even if it's like helping people just translate whatever... Book or... I book or content yeah. or website or app or yeah. thing, like just start there, get involved with others. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't like the it's inevitable uh, uh, meme. Me neither. I, I, I don't. I, I, I think, no, I think we are underestimating the power that we have as Bitcoiners already. You see it, the whole presidential uh, election thing. Like these politicians do not care about crypto and Bitcoin, but they're yep. in some way they are incentivized to say like I'm pro, I'm pro this and that. Yep. They they have no clue. They don't know. They couldn't. Do you think Trump can use a browser? I have no idea. I never think about like, it. No, but I mean, like you know, like, like yeah. We we are, we are so far ahead of all these people that are in charge, and I think that is what we should actually be aware of. Like the oh, the the woman I mentioned, Maya from Suriname, she's going to run in a presidential election in May next year. And I told her, you you should understand that there's like fifty million people on the internet that could amplify your message, and that is why you're going to win. They 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 don't have to be from Suriname. Mm -hmm. You know, like Bitcoiners online are a huge, huge, huge group, super powerful in terms of narrative messaging and, and, and all these things. Right. And so I think if more people realize that we can do crazy, crazy stuff because we can support the people that we align with all over the world, wherever yeah. they are, you know, and I think that is a very, uh, I, I love that as that's my main hopeful, uh, kind of like thought also currently, like we are there already. We are there. You can travel to any part in the world, put on Twitter, are there Bitcoiners? Can we hang out? Yeah. Like anywhere. Yeah. We are there already. Right. And, um, yeah, well, anyway, like that's, that's fascinating. I love that we are there. Um, I think you have like 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking about what, what question I wanted to ask you, but I, I think I want to ask you like, what is the main thing people need to unlearn before oh. they can understand Bitcoin? Um, I think the, it's a really good question because I like, I'm, I'm trying to think of like, what did I unlearn, but that's going to be different for everyone. Um. I think a lot of people who currently are in big corners, what they'll need to unlearn is like, it really just starts in a way with information where they feel like, like if they get told, like, if you vote for this other party, if you vote for this other politician, they're going to make life better. They're going to make the system better. And I think the unlearning that people need to do is assuming that someone else is going to make their life better. And they just mm. vote for that and that person makes the change happen. Um, like sort of like if you'd point me to the critical thing, like if you can make people unlearn one thing and that will get the most Bitcoin adoption, that's the thing I'd point at. Like just making more people realize that nobody is going to like materially in the long run make your life way better, better than you can do it yourself. Yes. So if people were to unlearn that part, then they'll eventually kind of like, I think a lot of them will eventually end up a Bitcoin because they'll realize, okay, I need to do it myself. 
And this is a really powerful tool to be able to do that. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. It's the, and it sounds so, uh, how do you say it? Like it sounds corny. Ar- arrogant sometimes oh. or corny. Like, yeah, you have to start thinking for yourself. Like, dude, what, what do you mean? But like, yeah, like really, <laughs> you know, like think, think about that. And, and, and that is that taking that responsibility. Like no one is coming to save you in a good way. Like it's in a, it's in a good way. Like that, yes, that person that you're voting for does not have the same interest in your specific individual life that you have, right? So how can that other person make your life better? You know, and and by the way, in general, and I wanted to say this before, but this is a, I think this is a way bigger thing in Western countries as opposed to, I don't know, third world-ish countries. Like there, people already have that entire mentality. Mm -hmm. Very sad because they are forced by, you know, you know, how their societies are, you know, maintained and also abused by our societies, right? Still. But but they have a way more clear perspective to life. Yeah. If literally no one is coming to save you. You are instantly humbled. And yeah. we still, and, and it's also how we grew up here is, yeah, other people take care of me and my surroundings and all these things but no like you have to do that and i think also then when you think like that you can also start contributing in whatever way you would contribute to whatever instead of being more of like a consumer yeah and it's not binary like it's it's not that people should just give up on politics altogether and politicians can never make your life better in any way i think anyway it's more that you can't outsource the thing entirely you yeah. will have to do things yourself. And I'd say like, maybe that's like, call it like 80% and the 20% is whatever society does. Um, I don't know whether that's a proper weighting, but that's kind of the idea. Like my message isn't like, forget about all that stuff and just do everything yourself. But it is, you're going to have to play a bigger role in taking ownership of your own life than you currently are. If, you, if you're like, you know, if you're someone who's not into Bitcoin yet, who looks at the future in a very doomy and gloomy way, then uh, start there, I think. Mm. Yeah. So how has Bitcoin changed your worldview or views? Um, Well, to be honest, like if I look back at my worldview before Bitcoin, it's like I was relatively young. I've I've been interested for the past decade or so. So I feel like what was my worldview? You know, it's just like informed based on the school or schools Mm. that I went to and like the stuff I heard on the news and the things that you read and the people you talk to. But it's much more narrow. So for me, if anything, Bitcoin has just helped me understand that the world is incredibly, like simultaneously incredibly simplistic, just driven by incentives and all of the outcomes that you see just kind of like come from that. And at the same time, so many things are so nuanced, like it's not so black and white of this specific thing caused that thing entirely, or these people all think this way, just almost everything out there, both in Bitcoin itself and outside of it are just on some kind of spectrum of extremities and the extremities are often like where the loudest people are so in general it's just like opened my view to knowing that i don't know that much about the world as i as i think i do and that typically most things that you dive into just have far more complexities and reasons behind it and are perceived differently by different people so for me if anything it's just been very humbling and interesting because it's introduced me to so many things I never thought I'd learn about to to your point earlier, like going anywhere in the world and just talking to other Bitcoiners and hearing how they live their life, how the people around them very often face very similar problems or have similar, similar questions. Um, but just gradually, as I get older, learning more and more about the, how the world actually works, I think, I, I mean, you assume anyway, maybe I still don't get it. Uh, but versus how it's presented as working which is just yeah. uh, super fascinating to me. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I uh, I love the saying, you know, once you know that you don't know everything, you know, then you are humbled quickly. Yeah. And 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 because of that, at least for me and I think also for you, like it it triggers that cur- you know, being intellectually curious part and therefore you start seeing that the world works different. You don't have to understand how exactly, but the fact that you understand that it works different than what is being fed to you through the TV, for example, that is already 
mind opening i would say right yeah, that, that draws you in even more like okay but well what do the people think that actually look at the tv and only think about that you know and then and then you start seeing those things so yeah i think um I, th- I think just that curious cu- curiosity comes back a lot in my conversations like that that is just it and that is i think also part of taking that responsibility and thinking for yourself and not just um yeah assuming that what someone else says uh you know that looks like a benefit for you is also actually a benefit for you like you still have to think for yourself you know there's there's reasons people say things so yeah yeah interesting it's fascinating i use the word fascinating also a lot because it's like a never-ending thing right yeah. it's just it just keeps going and you learn about all these different subjects and um yeah I, I like all these things so um yeah last question because i think you have to go but uh, i ask everyone the same question and that is what is a core belief you will never let go um i think the fact that human beings are incredibly resourceful and will continue to kind of like surprise people with where we can take this i that's for me like one of the things that i remain very hopeful about where we can take this space. Like I would never bet against core developers coming up with ways to make Bitcoin scale or, or coming up with ways to make it more private or for the Bitcoin community in general to enact like really beautiful and wonderful things in the world. So, uh, that's, uh, that's something that I, that I hold on to and that I hope we can, you know, make, make a huge impact on the world with, even if Bitcoin for some reason doesn't scale to billions of people. As long as, you know, we look back at our lives and think like, you know, to our point earlier, we gave it a shot and we made the most out of this. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's a belief that I hold on to dearly. Love that, man. So uh, great ending. Thanks so much for your time. And uh, yeah, man, I think we'll do this again and uh, we should meet sometimes. We're not, uh, we're not that far apart. Yeah. I mean, we have in uh, Madeira, I think, but beyond that, yeah, not too sure. much, but uh yeah, Let's we, could, do it. we could probably talk for hours. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. My pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.